will examine the short and long-term management challenges and strategic objections, objectives of the U.S. Agency for International Development as it contends with ever-increasing portfolio of foreign assistant needs and geopolitical objectives. Without objection, the chair, the chair and the ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening uh, statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks to be recognized. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. Today, we are holding this hearing on the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, its management challenges and strategic objectives. USAID is the lead federal agency that directs and manages U.S. development assistance programs. Over the past decade, USAID's role has been expanded to meet the many new challenges of the post-Cold War and 9-11 world. Reflecting the newfound importance of our nation's foreign assistant program, USAID's budget and responsibilities have been significantly enhanced over the past decade. Furthermore, the growing importance of the agency's mission is articulated in the President's evaluation of development to a theoretically equal footing with defense and diplomacy as part of the three Ds of U.S. national security policy. The question arises as to whether USAID is equipped to meet the new set of challenges. Many believe it's not, and that the agency lacks a clearly defined development strategy and suffers from significant management and human capital challenges and program duplication and overlap. I'm struck, uh, for example, by the number of United States government agencies that planned and implement foreign assistance programs. They have become so numerous that the Department of State and USID control a little over half of the U.S. foreign assistance budget. Taken alone, USAID, it is my understanding, manages just over 40 percent of the total U.S. foreign assistance budget. The proliferation of foreign assistance programs throughout the U.S. government has resulted in a patchwork of different programs with different strategic objectives. Many, if not most, of these programs are important and beneficial, but I'm concerned that there is a lack of coordination to ensure that the full benefits of these programs are realized. If USAID were in counseling, I would observe that it is a patient that suffers from serious identity issues. In effect, USAID has become everything to everyone. Each year, USAID is given new marching orders and budget authority. The program is that there is no, and the problem is that there is no programmatic consistency for meeting the agency's long-term strategic goals and objectives. Programs may take years to implement on the ground, but the agency's legislative authority may not reflect the realities of implementing programs on the ground. USAID's development strategy and strategic objectives may be further blurred by the semi-merger in 2006 of the Department of State and USAID, and as a result of the creation of the F Bureau and the Director of Foreign Assistance at State, 
USAID and state share identical strategic goals. The question arises now, are USAID's strategic goals too broad and oversized? Are we muddling foreign policy objectives with development objectives? Clearly, USAID's problem, if we are completely honest, are in part the making of ourselves, Congress. Many of us are aware that Congress has not passed a foreign assistance authorizing bill since 1985. In effect, the authorizing committee has been marginalized. So I applaud and fully support Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Berman's efforts to overhaul the antiquated Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 and to reinvigorate the authorization process. I believe the success of these efforts will have direct bearing on the future viability and success of the program. To date, the administration has not named a new administrator for USID. It is my sincere hope that the administration will name the new administrator as soon as possible. And let me assure my colleagues on the subcommittee that I intend to hold a follow-up hearing on USAID and invite the new administrator to testify once he or she has been put in place. And finally, I want to thank all the witnesses that are here today for taking time to appear before our subcommittee. Most of them have decades of experience working at USAID and have devoted their careers to development work. And I look forward to their comments on an issue that is sometimes overlooked by Congress, but is nonetheless an essential element of our nation's foreign security stat uh, status. All right, uh, the ranking member. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, um, to expedite the process, I'd like to introduce my opening statement um, <clears throat> with uh, in the <clears throat> a written form, please. <clears throat> and uh, objection. without objections, thank you. Uh, but let me just say, though, and uh, briefly, I think USA, I mean, AID has a long history of uh, service around the world. I think that, uh, frankly, historically, it's taken what's thrown at them and responded <clears throat> as best they could. <clears throat> let me say, though, uh, <clears throat> getting back to this issue of um, building on the concept of teaching people to um, fish rather than give them fish. Uh, my biggest concern is, is that um, there may be a lot of fault for USAID for problems that we face today. A lot of it may not be <clears throat> rightfully pointed out at, thank you, Madam Chair, the, uh, at the uh, organization because, like the Chair pointed out, there's a whole lot of other agents out there under um, the guise of USAID. And um, I think that one of the things that I, I would ask us to take a look at is the um, um, where are we going long range with this. And let me just say this to the gentleman here. <clears throat> you have a Democrat and Republican standing in front of you. We have a new administration <clears throat> that doesn't even have a head yet. I would like these hearings to be set as a proactive process rather than a reactive judgment the proactive process of pointing out to the new administrations the pitfalls, the mistakes in the past, the opportunities and successes of the past, so they can avoid those pitfalls and take advantage of the opportunities. And I hope all of you approach this to the attitude that here's a chance for your um, information and your experience, <clears throat> both positive and negative, are able to be contributed to help the next, this new administration um, maximize those opportunities and avoid the pitfalls. I think that's one thing Republicans and Democrats can do on this oversight committee now rather than waiting for a couple years and then having Republicans um, find ways of attacking the new administration and finding fault is for Democrats and Republicans to work together to uh, point out um, problems, challenges, so that the new administration can avoid them. Um, let me just say that one of the things that I feel really concerned about is that a lot of our foreign aid, um, aid 
goes in under the guise of teaching capitalism, teaching independence, teaching productivity. And what we end up doing then is teaching them corruption, mismanagement, and all the negative things um, that we point, we point to other countries about. And many times this is the only face, except for the military, that um, parts of the world know. And the last thing we want them to think, that what America's about is big guns and stupid government programs or inefficiency and corruption. I think that's the big challenge. Um, I, I, you just got to admit, around the world, some of them have to shake their head and how could America be as successful as it is if this is what it's all about. So I just got to tell you frankly, my perceptions, and I do not blame USAID alone on this, my perceptions of the greatest challenges we face today in Afghanistan is not militarily. I think the frontline failure in Afghanistan has been in our inability to go in and appropriately apply aid during the period of opportunity we had over the time. So I say this to the Bush administration, as big a supporter I've been on certain issues, I think that the aid program in Afghanistan has been a disaster. And what I want to do is make sure, and there's always reasons for that, believe me, I was a mayor when I was 27. I know it's easy for those who've never done anything to second jet guess those who are in there. Those who have never done anything have never made a mistake. But what I need, I really would ask you to do is f point out how we could have been done it better in places like Afghanistan so that the new administration can figure out how, it's, uh, how um, to avoid the problem so that our men and women who are fighting over there won't have to fight this war again and there will actually be a success. Because I think the success, Madam Chair, um, in our last two interventions is not going to be counted by um, the, the men and women who won the war. It's going to be counted by um, the economic and social success that we leave, we leave behind and our aid programs actually going to be the ones that pull that off. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Congressman Bill Bray. Now I'll yield Congressman Collier. Collier. Excuse me. I don't have a statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Congressman, do you have a statement to make? Congressman Collier, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, last week, Secretary Clinton testified before the Committee on Foreign Affairs, of which I'm a member, and I was pleased to hear that the State Department is pursuing a more comprehensive approach to diplomacy, one that will consist of something more than reaching for the holster. In the last eight years, USAID has been hollowed out. We need to restore USAID to being the premier development agency of the United States government. An ambitious foreign aid agenda is the necessary complement to this more thoughtful approach to diplomacy. As we learned and continue to learn from Afghanistan, it is essential to maintain a level of trust among the general population in which the United States has a national security interest. Only in the context of widespread fear and distrust of the United States can regimes such as the Taliban's emerge and consolidate power. We witness similar problems now in Pakistan where the Taliban has unfortunately a growing influence. Since prior to the Soviet invasion, we've invested billions of dollars in military aid for various factions and governments in Afghanistan and Pakistan, yet those countries are now controlled or in danger of falling under the control of factions whose raison d'etre is opposition to U.S. influence. Clearly, our aid has not been as efficacious as it could have been. I'd suggest that our foreign aid must be closely linked to our national security objectives, but must not be perceived as entirely self-interested. This necessitates investing in countries where there is not necessarily an immediate and clear national security interest. Moreover, aid should not be based on political alliances with certain parties or politicians. When we were funding Afghan revolutionaries in the 1980s, we did not anticipate that they would use their newfound skills to attack America two decades later. Our aid to Israel may be a model. Regardless of which party has been in power, the United States has provided aid to Israel and with great effect. Within this context of depoliticizing aid on one level so that it actually reflects our national agenda, I greatly appreciate the testimony we'll hear today. James Kunder notes in his testimony that we should have a more comprehensive strategic vision to guide our distribution of aid. This kind of long-term strategic planning could help avoid reactionary programs such as political interventions that sometimes end up being counterproductive. Michael Walsh, Walsh emphasizes the importance of maintaining USAID connections to small contractors because these non-governmental organizations are often closest to the people we want to serve. 
If we're attempting to build trust with populations in areas that are important to our national security, then this is an important ingredient of success. Again, I want to thank you, Chairwoman Watson, for holding this hearing, and I look forward to our ongoing efforts to enhance the efficacy of AID. Thank you. If there is uh, no additional testimony, uh, the subcommittee will now go to the witnesses before us today. And it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would like to ask all of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Now, let me begin again by welcoming and thanking our distinguished expert panelists for agreeing to be with us this morning. First, Mr. Michael Elf Walsh is the Director of Programs for Finance, Grants, and Contracts at Inside NGO and an Association for Chief Financial Officers and Grants and Contract Managers for Non-Governmental Organizations Working in International Development and Humanitarian Relief Programs. He previously, he previously served in various roles for two decades at the Agency for International Development and most recently worked as uh, AID's Chief Acquisition Officer and Procurement Executive. Then Mr. James Kunder is a founding member of the Kunder Reali, is that correct? <laughs> Associates, an Alexandria-based consulting firm focusing on international development and reconstruction issues. It is a senior resident fellow in economic policy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Since 1987, he has served in multiple senior positions at AID, both domestically and abroad, and until January 2009 was acting deputy administrator. In addition, he has published numerous articles on international humanitarian issues, peacekeeping, and crisis management. Mr. George Ingram is Executive Director of the Education Policy and Data Center in the Academy for Educational Development. The center works to improve education policies and programs in developing countries through better access, use, and analysis of education data and information. He also serves as President of the U.S. Global Leadership Campaign an alliance of more than 400 companies and NGOs that promote greater resources for U.S. engagement in international affairs. Prior to his work in the private sector, Mr. Ingram was a senior staff member of the House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs responsible for international economic and development issues. And then Dr. Thomas Melito is a director in the International Affairs and Trade Team at GAO. In this capacity, he is primarily responsible for GAO work involving the management of development assistance by the U.S. agencies and multilateral organizations. Over the past 10 years, Mr. Melito has been focusing on a wide range of issues, including UN management reform, peacekeeping procurement, the efficacy of international food assistance, and combating human trafficking. trafficking. Mr. Melito holds an MA and a PhD in economics from Columbia University and a BS in industrial and labor relations from Cornell University. I welcome all the witnesses and we look forward to your testimony. And uh, I would ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony and try to keep this summary under five minutes if you can. Uh, your complete written statement will be included 
in the hearing record. So, Mr. Walsh, we will start with you. Please proceed. Thank you. I'd like to thank the subcommittee for taking the time to look into these important issues and the opportunity to share my perspective. This morning, I'd like to speak to you about the opportunities and challenges facing USAID and the broader NGO community. As I was leaving USAID in 2007, an estimated 50 percent of USAID foreign, so foreign service officers were eligible for retirement. As, as they leave, their years of experience leave with them. Since then, approximately 50 percent of the USAID officers have less than five years' experience with USAID. These newly minted officers represent a new USAID, a new USAID that, one, must bridge the experience gap by bringing in more mid-level foreign service officers and providing entire, the entire workforce with better training and supervision. Two, do more than just award grants and contracts, but support their procurement system with more staff and funding to update policies and procedures and roll out worldwide systems. And three, address real operational issues, those identified by a formal committee of USAID, NGO, and contractor operationals professionals with congressional support to look at the actual nuts and bolts of implementing foreign assistance. Now is the time to commit to change. Regarding my first recommendation, USAID staff need more technical and professional training. They've simply lost their technical edge. And beyond classroom training and web-based training, they need knowledge management systems, conferences, and other opportunities for professionals to share ideas and experiences, especially with experts in the broader sector. Also, USAI needs the authority to hire mid-level staff to narrow the technical and experience gap. Until this can be done, USAID will continue to bundle larger awards made through limited competition. As a consequence, small and medium-sized organizations have difficulty competing. The large get larger and the others don't. The resulting concentration of the sector means fewer new ideas and approaches to address the challenges of development. The burden of overregulation and multiple layers of audit coupled with staff with limited experience result in a compliance-oriented risk avoidance approach, approach to management. We heard of a technical representative who tracked all grantee travel and field trips with a matrix to carefully assure that they performed as proposed. Uh, he didn't have time to visit the field sites to get a first-hand look at the work. We've got to get beyond auditing to the penny and support managing to the dollar, risk management rather than risk avoidance. The contracting officers I supervise in East Africa flew into southern Sudan and saw firsthand the challenges of, of working there. The terminal is often just a cluster of thorn trees, and the roads are only notional. Yet the NGOs working there must still comply with Buy American, Fly American, and Drive American, while documenting every penny and every partner. I expected my CEOs, my contracting officers, to understand this context and manage it appropriately within the rules and regulations. USAID's experienced procurement policy and support staff have this development perspective as well, yet they are overwhelmed. At this point, there is one person responsible for all grant policies at USAID, which represents approximately $4 billion annually. Another specialist is responsible for personal services contracts, which is the employment mechanism used to engage half of USAID's workforce, especially overseas. Only four people are available to negotiate overhead, and that's probably the largest ratio of negotiators to cognizant agencies of any other civilian agency in, in the government. And just four people conduct audits around the world. Okay? They need help, especially if USAID is to move forward with a new workforce and a new Foreign Assistance Act. As you address issues in the Foreign Assistance Act, please do not neglect to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of implementation. The fly, buy, drive American requirements come from another era, but the importance of development to national security suggests that Congress should consider trade-offs between tied aid and the effective use of the development dollar. Further, the approvals associated with these requirements are very cumbersome, requiring, for example, every single international trip to have prior approval and the protracted waiver process to purchase laptops and right-hand drive vehicles because none are made in the United States. We encourage Congress to consider establishing a formal advisory committee of USAID, NGO, and contractor representatives, an operation, uh, operations issues review committee to examine long-standing imp impediments to efficient and effective implementation. We ask for congressional support to assure that the new USAID and its contractors and grantees are not saddled with encumbrances from the old USAID. Development is simply too important to tolerate this any longer. 
I spent three years as a director of OAA trying to update policies, roll out systems, and upgrade the skills of our staff with budgets that were regularly cut. It doesn't work. USAID represents so much to the world, they must be supported with adequate funding and renewed support for efficient and effective aid delivery. I'm happy to respond to your questions and look forward to working with you as you undertake this important endeavor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Walsh. And now, Mr. Kinder, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I uh, want to jettison my prepared remarks because I I've had the honor of testifying many times before the House of Representatives, and I, so f I have to say that I, I just think the, uh, the statements, the opening statements, have captured many of the issues, uh, perhaps better than I've ever heard them captured in opening statements before. I think the, less the, the lesson of USAID, the history of USAID and our country's foreign aid program, is a, is a story of recapturing the same lessons over and over again. During the height of the Cold War, we understood that if America's foreign policy was going to work, we were going to have to reach the hearts and minds of people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And that's why we built up something like the U.S. Foreign Aid Program that had about 10,000 employees at that time. Then during the 1990s, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, with moves towards greater government efficiency, we decided we really didn't need all these tools of foreign policy. And we let the number of USAID foreign service officers, the American technical experts that we send to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, decline to just over 1,000 scattered across 85 countries of the developing world. And now I think once again in the context of Afghanistan, the many other threats to our national security in the developing world, we understand once again that this is a capacity that we have needed and desperately need today. So the four points I touch on in, in my uh, testimony, Madam Chair, are simply number one, that we do need a comprehensive strategy. We do not have a consensus within the U.S. government between the Congress and the administration, the previous one or this one, on what exactly we want to accomplish with our foreign aid program. Do we want to help our friends? Or do we want to eliminate illiteracy and disease from the face of the earth? I would respectfully submit that if the Congress ordered the U.S. Agency for International Development to eliminate illiteracy from the face of the earth in the next 20 years and said, we don't care where you give the money, we don't care how much money our friends get, we just want you to eliminate illiteracy, they would eliminate illiteracy. But the problem is they're told to eliminate illiteracy and protect mountain gorilla habitat and give money to our friends and about 20 other objectives. Uh, and that's what causes confusion in our foreign aid program. Second, we do need to rebuild the staffing. As I mentioned, we've had about an 80% decline in our foreign service officer workforce at USAID. It strikes me as very telling that our nation has recently made a decision that potential instability in Africa is critically important and therefore we've created U.S. Africa Command, a new U.S. military command to treat problems of instability in Africa. Now I have nothing against U.S. military, I was proud to wear the American military uniform myself, but it strikes me that at AFRICOM headquarters, at AFRICOM headquarters in Stuttgart, Germany, we have 1,600 personnel. 1,600 American personnel because we care about instability in Africa. USAID has 460 officers scattered across all of Africa, actually working in the African countries to address instability. So somehow we've let our numbers and our toolkit get distorted over the last couple of years. The third point I make is that um, in my testimony is that uh, as, as a number of the members have said, we do have a proliferation of, of more domestic agencies getting involved in the foreign aid program. I take a, a somewhat iconoclastic point of view, Madam Chair. I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. I don't think you can tell the United States Environmental Protection Agency, don't think about Africa, don't think about Latin America, because these environmental problems are global. Same thing with Centers for Disease Control. Obviously, today the headlines are swine flu. We can't let health care protection stop at the national boundaries. We need to pay attention to what's going on globally, but we do need to create, I argue, a new set of coordination mechanisms, I would argue under the aid administrator, so that all cylinders are firing together. All parts of the U.S. government that have some overseas responsibilities are coordinating their efforts. And then the fourth point, which a number of members also uh, 
touched on already is that this question of consolidation between state and aid. I touch on the security issues. Um, what distinguished the U.S. foreign aid program positively during much of its history was the people-to-people -people aspect of it. American technical experts reaching out to Africans, reaching out to Asians, reaching out to Latin Americans. And in, in our current security environment, what we're doing is instead of these folks out in the rice paddies and out in the farmer's fields, more and more we're consolidating our development experts out of security concerns in these fortress embassies around the world. And whereas before a woman, a woman's group in Africa or a farmer's group could walk up to the aid office building, knock on the door and actually meet some Americans and find out we don't all have horns, now they can hardly get past the Marine Guard detachment to, to actually meet any Americans. So I think there are some real challenges in this consolidation of state and, and USAID that I think are undercutting our attempts to uh, in, increase American influence in the developing world. And I, I just want to add uh, what Mr. Walsh said. I really appreciate the committee taking an interest in this it, because it is an area that most folks don't pay much attention to, but it's critically important to our nation's foreign policy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And uh, now we're going to go to Dr. Malato. You may proceed. Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to be here to discuss the challenges currently facing the U.S. Agency for International Development in establishing a strategic acquisition and assistance workforce plan. USAID's total foreign assistance has more than doubled since fiscal year 2002 from about $5 billion to about $11 billion in fiscal year 2008. Most notably, obligations overseas increased by 600 percent from about $1 billion in fiscal year 2002 to about $6 billion in fiscal year 2008. Given USAID's reliance on non-governmental organizations to implement its activities, it is vital that the agency effectively manage those activities, especially overseas. My testimony today is based on a report we issued in September 2008. I will focus on three topics. First, I will discuss USAID's capacity to develop and implement a strategic acquisition and assistance workforce plan. Second, I will describe the extent to which USAID can evaluate its acquisition and assistance function. And finally, I will summarize our recent recommendations as well as the actions that USAID has taken in response. Regarding the first issue, in September 2008, we reported that USAID lacked the capacity to develop and implement an acquisition and assistance strategic workforce plan. We found that the agency lacked sufficiently reliable and up-to-date overseas staff level data, including information on their competencies, you say staff are responsible for monitoring the activities of recipients to provide reasonable assurance that the funds provided are used in accordance with applicable regulations and sound business practices. Without sufficiently reliable and up-to-date data on its overseas staff levels and their competencies, you say it cannot identify its critical staffing needs and adjust its staffing patterns to meet those needs. We witnessed this, weekend, this weakness during our field visits to seven you say missions last year. At five missions we visited, the number of staff with the necessary competencies were considerably less than adequate, while at two missions they were more than adequate. For example, mission officials in Mali said they had delayed time-sensitive seasonal agricultural projects because staff were not available when needed to approve contracts. Our survey of acquisition and assistance staff overseas supported these findings from our field work. For example, about 70 percent of respondents overseas reported that it was somewhat or very difficult to alter staffing patterns to meet the demands of changing workloads. USAID has launched some ad hoc attempts to address weaknesses in its acquisitions and assistance workforce. However, these efforts lack critical elements of a strategic workforce plan, particularly comprehensive information on its staff overseas. I will now turn to my second topic. USAID has not implemented an evaluation mechanism to provide adequate oversight of its acquisition and assistance function. Such oversight is essential for ensuring adherence to USAID regulations and policies, especially overseas. In fiscal year 2007, USAID developed an annual scorecard evaluation as a mechanism for assessing weaknesses in operations. The scorecard will also function as a risk-based approach to determine locations for on-site visits. While USAID has finished, finished piloting the scorecard evaluation, it has not implemented it. Without implementing this mechanism, USAID cannot certify the overall adequacy and effectiveness of management controls, 
for its acquisition and assistance function. To, con to address the concerns I've just summarized, we recommended in our September 2008 report that the administrator of USAID develop and implement a strategic and assistance workforce plan that matches resources to priority needs, such as the evaluation function. USAID agreed that it needed to put in place a strategic workforce plan that includes all of USAID's acquisition and assistance staff at overseas missions. While USAID officials informed us that they have improved guidance to missions for pre preparing staffing data, they cannot ensure that all missions are accurately capturing these data or instituting procedures to ensure that the data reported from overseas missions are reliable. In addition, USAID officials do not expect to begin collecting competency information for overseas staff until 2011 at the earliest. Finally, USAID has increased, increased its staff for evaluations from four in fiscal year 2008 to nine as of April 2009. However, it has not implemented the evaluation mechanism and has completed evaluations of only two missions since the time of our report. USAID officials they have been said that they have been unable to make further advances due to other priorities. Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my prepared statement. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And uh, now, Mr. Ingram, you may proceed. Madam Chair and member of the subcommittees. Is it on now? Yes. Oh, you want it closer? Pull it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to focus on the strategic aspects, the strategic infrastructure that's necessary to get to those management challenges and changes. And I've provided a rather detailed statement, but I'm going to follow the outline that occurs at the back of it in the last three pages, which tries to set out a picture, an overall picture of the steps that are necessary to bring a coherent, elevated development function to the U.S. government. One is leadership. The U.S. government needs to be structured with strong leadership that has the ability to speak with a single voice on development issues and that therefore can leverage and maximize the impact of U.S. investment in development. Two, as Mr. Kunder said, we need a plan. We need a global development strategy that is constructed in an open, transparent fashion that articulates a coherent, realistic set of objectives and priorities for U.S. assistance and how we are, will accomplish them. Three, that strategy should contribute to an executive branch legislative agreement on the purposes and objectives of foreign assistance that is codified in a new statute that replaces the Foreign Assistance Act and provides a clear statement of the goals and priorities and lines of authorities and accountability and that allows the managers of our assistance programs the flexibility that is needed to respond to the opportunities in developing countries. Four, all core development activities should be streamlined into a single organizational entity built on the best practices of all the component parts. Some functions may maintain their unique characteristics and identity, such as the MCC and PEPFAR. Others may remain independent, such as OPIC and TDA and regional foundations, but are brought into a close coordination with the core development organization. This development function needs to be both independent and integrated with the rest of the U.S. government. There need, it needs a degree of separation from the demands of other U.S. government policies in order to preserve the programs that address the long-term nature of development. But it also needs to be integrated to ensure that development programs are consistent and support U.S. foreign policy objectives. The mechanisms to accomplish this duality include, on the independent side, USAID having strong, respected leadership that is empowered to lead the U.S. government on development issues. And USAID needs a direct reporting line to OMB. On the integrated side, USAID operates under the foreign policy guidance of the Secretary of State. There is a government-wide global development strategy to lead what all departments are doing in the development area. 
USAID country missions, operate as part of the U.S. government country team under the direction of an ambassador, and there would be joint staffing, including, I would suggest, that responsibility for multilateral assistance and policy towards development-related international organizations should be brought into a new USAID Office of Multilateral Development that is jointly staffed by professionals from AID, the Treasury Department, and the State Department. And finally, the agency needs to be, needs its systems and processes and staffing rebuilt and redesigned along the lines that my colleagues have spoken of. Thank you. I want to thank all of the witnesses for your testimony. And we're going to now move to the question period and proceed under the five-minute rule. Uh, I'm going to uh, begin with uh, questioning Mr. Kunder, and then I'd like all of you to address this particular question. Mr. Kunder, you stated in your testimony that establishment of a comprehensive set of strategic goals for the U.S. foreign aid program is management challenge number one and should be the centerpiece of any effort to rewrite foreign aid uh, legislation in this Congress. And what elements or point do you think should be incorporated into a strategic plan for USAID? And should a new set of strategic goals be the centerpiece of any foreign aid rewrite? And then the others can chime in when he finishes. Thank you, ma'am. I, I mean, we could obviously have a three-day workshop on that uh, question, but I to give you a real Just quick hit answer. The high points. <laughs> I think the, um, I think our nation understands that it is in our strategic interest to help our allies at one level, and that at another level, to take on the global scourges that make people discouraged, distraught, and become terrorists around the world. And and obviously, there are a lot of suffering people around the world who give up, who are desperate, and who are attracted by extremist ideologies. And, and conceptually, what we need to do is, is, is run a foreign policy that operates at both, le both levels. We need to help our strategic friends, but we also need to take on these long-term uh, issues that afflict mankind, which lead to hurting our nation in the long run. The, the British system has, uh, has recognized this explicitly, and they have both a Department of Foreign Affairs and then a Department for International Development. So they've explicitly taken both challenges on within the structure of their executive branch. We have not done that. We don't have a Department for International Development. But I would argue that what this strategy should do is explicitly give USAID the function of taking on the long-term challenges. Take on the health care challenges, take on the unemployment challenges, the, the desperation challenges, the lack of literacy. A place like Afghanistan, probably more than half the population can't even read. So here we are trying to convince folks of a certain worldview that supports our foreign policy, they can't even read information that we distribute in the country. So you've got to take on that level of issue. So my argument would be you create a strategic plan embedded in the Foreign Assistance Act that does take into account the priorities of the Congress and the administration, but you give aid the task of eliminating illiteracy, eliminating disease, making sure that people have access to credit around the world so they can get a, a decent job. And, and I would agree with, with my, what Mr. Bilbray said earlier. This can't all be a government function. I mean, we need to work directly with people, with private sector organizations, as well as government. And those would be, we could go into more detail, but those would be what I would consider the core elements of a long-term strategic plan for our foreign aid program. Mr. Walsh. I would simply add that uh, these, these strategic aspirations need to be properly resourced. If you, you, sp you speak to these getting microfinance to the villagers and what have you, you need to have mechanisms and the staff that can actually do that. So I just plead that you don't neglect the, the resourcing aspects of, of the strategy. Thank you. Dr. Melito? I'd like to add that <clears throat> um, USAID's management structure is sort of very decentralized when it comes to overseas. They really have, don't have a good handle of 
staff levels overseas or actually they can't really control very much in terms of certain staff uh, functions overseas. So if it does something at headquarters in a strategic manner, they need to confront the decentralized uh, leadership it has overseas. Mr. Ingram. Uh, I would just add that I think a couple of aspects of the global development strategy that are important are, one, there should be a focus on local capacity building. That almost all of our programs should focus on helping the people in country own the programs that are being carried out and build up their own capacity. And, so, and secondly, I think there should be an emphasis on innovation and risk taking. I would love to see a message sent from the Congress to the managers of our foreign assistance programs that we expect you to take risk. We don't expect corruption and misuse of money, but we expect you to take programmatic risk and to find those new innovative interventions that are going to make a difference. All right. Uh, the, your testimony said that uh, USAID's technical tools are lacking. So like georeferencing systems, ability to teleconference, uh, ability to call on security assets and so forth. How can the USAID improve in this area? The, the agency has um, a, a, a very, uh, in my view, a strange uh, appropriations account structure vis-a-vis -vis the Congress. That is to say it is given what are called program funds, the money to actually run the health care programs, the education programs, and so forth, then given a separate operating expense budget. And this has been a, this has been a, a series of decisions over the last decades now, both by the administration and by the Congress and under both Democratic and Republican leadership on both sides, that we, in my view, we've simply under-resourced the organization. The operating expense budget has resulted in an 80 percent decline in staffing. And the argument I was making, Madam Chair, is that I don't think that we need a million people running foreign aid. I think it should be a relatively small, highly trained uh, cadre of people. But that's why I made the point that if we're going to put 1,300 people in Stuttgart, Germany, just for AFRICOM headquarters, we certainly need more than 1,000 officers scattered around the entire world because you do have to get out and talk to people. But the particular point I was making is that if we are going to send these officers out to the field, they need world-class technological system so that they, if they find a disease in the village, they should be able to take a blood sample, plug it into their computer, transmit the data back to headquarters, and find out what's going on. We need to, it's cost effective to magnify the impact of each of these small number of officers by giving them the technological capability that they need. And that is something that because of year after year having very constrained operating expense budgets at USAID, they're simply, I, I, would, agree, I would agree with Mr. Walsh, they simply don't have the technological edge they once did. These were the folks who brought the world the Green Revolution uh, back in the 70s. They were at the technological cutting edge at one point. And, uh, and as uh, Mr. Ingram just said, they are no longer there. And that's what I was arguing in my testimony. We need to reinvest in these people. Thank you. Let me just throw this out to Mr. Ingram. Uh, you're a former Capitol Hill staffer with years of experience in the Foreign Affairs Committee. It's my understanding that you were the principal lead staffer on a massive rewrite of the Foreign Assistance Act over a decade ago. And uh, what is the single most important factor or element, in your opinion, that needs to be included in a successful foreign assistance rewrite? Thank you, Madam. Uh, I think it starts with getting broad ownership in rewriting the act. Um, when we tried to rewrite the act, and we did 20 years ago, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and it passed the House, we never garnered the interest or the support of the Senate or the administration. I would love to see this next rewrite started with a joint drafting committee by the House, the Senate, um, and the executive branch. And I think your committee getting interested in this, getting other committees interested in, in it, will broaden the ownership and involvement of members of Congress and create a critical mass uh, that would allow you to get this through final enactment. I think the other two quick things I would say is the, the congressional leaders in this need to set out a vision 
and principles for what they expect to be in this act. And I use the example of the Millennium Challenge account where the president set out a clear vision, parameters on what was going to be in it, and the players both in the Congress and in the civil society stayed within those parameters and kept certain negative aspects out of that legislation. Thank you so much. Uh, I now recognize our ranking member, uh, Mr. Bill Bray, uh, for his five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Kerner, th thank you very much for pointing out this issue that we need to understand the end game. I guess one of the things that those of us in the first world forgot, the great struggles that we've had in the last century of eliminating child inf um, infant mortality, or infant mortality being eliminated or reduced substantially, and we thought it was a great thing. but. We did that and didn't develop the economic backbone to be able to support an economy to support the increased population. And then we are all upset about how many people are starving in the third world. And so I think outcome does matter. Um, and any of us that grew up in neighborhoods like I grew up in know that you only want to live in a government-built uh, society if they're the private sector society isn't available. I think public housing is a good example. None of us would wish that on somebody unless it was just last its chance. So I think we've got to remember the outcome is a strong social economic structure to, um, for the community wherever we're working. i got a question for you. Um, we have how many agents in Africa right now? The um, 460 American Foreign Service officers. USAID does one very excellent thing around the world, and that is if you were to go to one of our offices in Africa, we hire a lot of African technical that. experts. So that's, that, that's a feature, but I'm talking about the American 460 USAID Foreign Service officers across Africa. Yeah, I've got Australian cousins who actually have worked with the American side of this thing. Um, what do we have in, in Central America right now? you have any idea what we have, South America, uh, I mean, uh, south of Mexico, north of Colombia? Um, uh, less than that, sir. I mean, one of the unfortunate Substantially aspects. Substantially less. What, what, one of the unfortunate aspects when you squeezed the staffing was that we actually diverted staff to Asia and Africa because that's where the terrorist threat was. And one of the horrible outcomes is we've stripped our staff from the Western Hemisphere. Madam Chair, I only bring this up because this really has been an issue that we've ignored our own backyard. And just in the last two months, right. we've lost two governments that were very pro-United States, very pro-private investment. And they've gone totally south on us because we sort of ignored our friends in our own backyard. And so I just wanted to raise that um, when we raise this issue. And I hope that there's an awareness that a lot of the challenges we have in the United States is directly related to Central America, and we just look totally past it. And the Bush administration was, did it too. I mean, talk about Colombia, talk about Brazil, but my God, we just look, you know, just seems like totally ignore countries like Nicaragua and El Salvador and Costa Rica and Panama. Um, let, me, let me go bow over Mr. Walsh. I got a question for you. Um, when we, when a, um, a nonprofit ends up uh, claiming to have planted crops in, uh, you know, to get a grant, and they certify their grant. Um, in fact, let me say this because young people are here. We all know in Alexandria that if somebody said, I planted uh, almonds at, in Alexandria, you'd give the address, wouldn't you, at this location. Most young people don't know. In the third world, there is no addresses. In fact, most of the time, there's no street names except for highway names. How would you identify, you know how we would identify in Alexandria, how would you end up identify a field in Kandahar? Uh, I understand that in places like Afghanistan and southern Sudan and in many places where the NGO community is working, they rely on GPS uh, data. In fact, I, I believe that the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance has routinely requested that kind of information because the refugee camps are oftentimes moving and such. So they, they have uh, tried to capture that data, although I cannot say that it's comprehensive and complete. I have to, and I can give you more detail if I can. If and I that know. obviously is the kind of new technology we not only should be using, but we have to use because what you run into, and Madam Chair, I'll tell you, you run into um, somebody will get a grant, get credit for it, and they'll actually have photos of somebody else's orchard field um, in, you know, plugged in as the documentation. And as you pointed out, this issue of we want to know was the augers to plant the trees made in America, but we, nobody ever goes out to see if the trees were ever planted in the field at the GPS location they pointed out. 
Um, and um, I th I'm glad to hear you say that because that is one of those great breakthroughs we've had. And around the world, one of the biggest problems is you don't know how to tell somebody how to get somewhere because they don't have addresses. And great thing is now the GPS location, those five digits, two lines of five digits, are going to be our addresses in the future. And it's a great breakthrough. But I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, the big question I've got, though, is that I really think, and I'll say this again, Mr. Walsh, is I think that the amount of money we threw in Afghanistan in the nonprofits um, were not, you know, it was a very large amount for how much oversight we had here. How can we crack down on this, uh, especially when we point out that we have, um, a good example was the, an uh, 08, we had a USPI charged with conspiracy and fraud in connection to uh, uh, services rendered in Afghanistan. Um, you know, what does the um, Inspector General have to do to make sure that we eliminate that kind of fraud in our, in our pro, um, programs? Because we, we've, we talk so much about the for-profit problems, but not enough. It's almost as if if somebody um, files and becomes a nonprofit, they're exempt from all the temptations that apply to for-profit. In fact, I would offer that the, the not-for-profit not 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 world is, uh, is, a, is a sensitive about the, the, the care with which they manage not only the taxpayers' money, but the donations that they receive from private citizens. And, and it's, they have a track record of, of preserving that and, and, and managing that as effectively as they can because it's one thing to have a disallowance and an audit under a grant from, with USAID, but it's another thing to have in the paper that the donations that are going to this organization is being used to finance a tennis court in, in Kandahar or something like that. that. That kind of publicity doesn't work for these NGOs. They are very careful about how they spend the money. Now, having said that, we recognize that there's always going to be risk. So their challenge has been to manage risk uh, in a highly compliance-oriented environment in a also very risk-averse environment where not only do you have the issues that I mentioned, uh, but also auditors that are there, investigators that are more than eager to look for malfeasance and such, they're very self-conscious about that. Their challenge is trying to do it in the same sort of resource-constrained environment as USAID. They, they have uh, pressures on their overhead, they have pressures on their direct costs, and they're trying to do basically uh, development on the cheap as well as everybody else. Uh, Afghanistan is a huge challenge, and, and it, it, I, I believe it, it was moving quickly and, and probably didn't, weren't fully resourced on the operational side. So you're just going to have these kind of vulnerabilities. Okay, well, let me just tell you from my personal observation, not just as a congressman, but as somebody who spent some time in third world mm -hmm. with the locals, the nonprofits tend to stick in their face even more than the government operations. Um, and the feedback of where you've got nonprofits that are using resources in a manner that the local sea is flaunting just huge amounts of wealth. And I just found a lot of resentment for the nonprofits. And I think the problem is, is because um, there may be nonprofits managing here in the United States, but they're not spending enough time down looking at exactly how the money's being spent out in the third world. And the people on the front line, um, the, the citizens of these third world countries, they see it right along. They see it when some young kid goes by in a huge yacht with a big nonprofit name across it, and they're, they're saying, you know, my God, that could be a hundred pongas used to help to, to feed, you know, ten, ten villages. Um, so that concern of oversight is something I think that we have not focused enough on, and that's the nonprofit oversight. And I hope to be able to see us how to do it. I'd like, to, and that's what I'm saying when I start this off, I would really, really like to say, how do we help this new administration avoid those pitfalls and focus on that? Um, because I think that too much of us have had the pro problem that for profit we had a certain mindset and for non profit we had a sep separate mindset. And I think we need to put it back together and understand the potential for problems exist in both of these, these uh, vehicles and we need to make sure we got the oversight. You've got real problems there and we can talk about that future about your transition with your experience. If we can put up tag teams where you have experience and new guys going in so there's a learning process and the way we phase out law enforcement we always made sure that we tried to put the more experienced officer with the less experienced officer so that gets transferred through use. So I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. It seems to me in listening to the testimony, we sort of have three broad problems with 
with AID? One is, what's its purpose and what's its mission in the post-Cold War era? Uh, the second is capacity. It's been hollowed out. And the third is sort of, uh, it's an orphan. Uh, to whom does it report? Uh, is it an adjunct of the State Department? Is it a freestanding agency? And we've sort of gone back and forth over the decades as to what is the proper model. Let me start with that third piece for a second. Um, Secretary Rice created the office of DFA. Um, I last was up here 20 years ago and I worked with uh, George Ingram and I worked with Margaret and some others uh, on the foreign aid bill. In fact, I think we were the last crowd to pass a foreign aid authorization bill. Um, it, I don't understand what motivated the secretary to create this office when you had an AID administrator. How did it work? What is the relationship between the aid administrator and the DFA? And should we change that as we're looking at this overhaul? Ms. Ingram. Any of you can answer, but I'll start with George. Um, thank you. I think the, I think administrations for 20 years um, have been coming up with, with new programs and new initiatives and have looked at USAID and said, well, that's a mishmash. I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if it can manage this new one. I want a, a new entity to manage it. And this has gotten out of hand over, the, over recent years. Um, and the Director of Foreign Assistance was created in the State Department, uh, as I understand it, because the Secretary could not obtain the knowledge she wanted on what was happening in democracy. Um, and so she said, we're going to bring together the information, the consolidation. And what happened was it turned into not just an information center, but a decision-making center. Um, and decisions were taken from the field and from AID and put in this Washington-centric entity that was unfortunately removed from what was going on in, in the field. Um, the second problem with it is it really only had jurisdiction over a large part of AID and part of the State Department, but not a lot of foreign assistance that other agencies do and even parts, of the, parts that the State Department does. So absolutely, the, the effort to reform, to consolidate, to streamline needs to include um, the Office of the Director of Foreign Assistance. And the State Department clearly needs the capacity to look at foreign assistance from a strategic point of view and from a foreign policy point of view. But it needs to, as it did in the 60s and 70s, I would argue, and even 80s, respect the role of the implementing organization to set the policies and to manage the programs. Others? Mr. Kuhn. Sir, I, I believe, um, <clears throat> first of all, I, I, I agree, basically agree with what George said. Uh, Secretary Rice famously asked one meeting, how much money are we giving to Pakistan? And the folks from the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau raised their hand and said what they were doing. Then the folks from the Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor raised their hand and said what they, and aid raised it. And she finally pounded her fist and said, well, who, who has the total number? And of course, the answer was nobody did. And so it was, as George said, seen as a reform where we can get all the numbers on the right page and have some clear-cut hierarchical system for allocating the resources. I think what's happened, sir, is that two things have gotten confused here. One is a perfectly natural desire to have transparency in the budget. As George said, you can create a budget shop that, that adds up all the numbers, make sure they all add up. And that's gotten confused with a bureaucratic tendency on the part of the State Department, which has been, at least in the last eight years, buffeted by DOD, to pull aid ever closer to itself. It, part of that is, in my view, misguided efficiency moves. Wouldn't it be better if we had uh, one paper copier in the long way Malawi rather than two? And some of it's just small bureaucratic thinking. Part of it is that, that state has felt overwhelmed by DOD, and probably the biggest thing they've got going for them to have a face, a visibility, a humanitarian uh, implement is AID. So I think uh, two things have gotten uh, unfortunately confused in this whole DFA process. That's my interpretation, let, sir. Let me, let me just ask a, a follow-up to that. One of the concerns I've always had about that kind of consolidation within State Department is that you're, 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 uh, 
you're melding an operational agency, or at least it once was an operational agency. They actually did things. Mr. Bilbray pointed out, you know, in local government we actually do things. Uh, we build things. We provide services and so forth. Uh, whereas State Department is a policy uh, shop. And so uh, you now have an operational agency coming ever closer within the bosom of an agency that frankly doesn't, isn't operational uh, in that sense. And I just think that's a clash of cultures that doesn't work very well. Uh, we, I think we would Absolutely. agree with that. We would agree with you. <laughs> and, and sir, I, I, sp I had the honor of serving in the United States Marine Corps and for 200 years the United States Army said, wouldn't it be a lot more efficient if we just moved the Marine Corps into the Army? And I felt the same way at AID that you know, there are always some budgetary reasons why we can save a few dollars, but unfortunately what you do is undercut our nation's toolbox. Uh, foreign policy toolbox by, by bringing these organizations together. Mr. Chairman, my time is up, but I, I, and I hope we'll have another round because I've got lots more to go into, but um, I certainly would hope that on our agenda and on the, uh, uh, the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee's agenda, as we look at a rewrite of foreign aid, uh, with the best of intentions, we've got to look at sort of the uh, structure that we're inheriting because it doesn't seem to be very functional. Thank you. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, in uh, reading the GAO report uh, and talking about the difficulties with overseeing the ANA process, um, I note the growth from five billion to eleven billion dollars, um, and also uh, what I want to ask about is this: in in the ideal world, if you could fashion our international assistance and development efforts from scratch. What model would we best follow? A model where we were supervising contractors or a model where uh, the agency, with, in whatever form, let's assume in, in an appropriate form, itself undertook the operations, or some form of both. Mr. Melito, you want to start? I'm hesitant to say what is the best model, because I don't know if there is a best model. What I do want to stress, though, is whatever model you choose, you need to implement it fully, and you need to take oversight very seriously. When we began our work, AID had only four individuals responsible for overseeing all of the contracts and assistance agreements they made worldwide. At that time, it was $10 billion overseen by four people. That was their evaluation function. The, uh, the IG at the time said that they were basically only able to visit nine missions overseas over a three-year period. So I don't think AID had any capacity to say that it was able to control its money, to know that its systems were in place that it actually had any assurance that any particular regulations, any concerns it had over the proper use of money was actually implemented. That's not to say that, it wasn't, uh, that money was stolen or anything, just that it had no way of assuring that itself. So I would say whatever model you choose, please make sure that oversight and evaluation is a part of that model. And I do think uh, there's recent uh, evidence that AID is taking that seriously. They plus up that staff from four to nine. But it's $11 billion and 60% of it occurs overseas. So I'm not sure what the right number is. And I'm not sure exactly how they're going to do that. But it's not yet the priority it needs to be. Uh, any other thoughts from the panel? Mr. Mr. Walsh? Uh, yes, I'd like to offer that, that one of the challenges the U.S. government has in general is sustaining a, uh, a technical edge uh, because it's, it's a heavily, it's, a, it's very expensive to invest in the training and to take people offline considering their work, work, workforce. So the best model would be in terms of achieving or utilizing technical excellence is to rely on the commercial or the private sector. Uh, and then you hopefully, and, and the expectation is that the government would have the ability to define the requirement and monitor accomplishment. But you know, the, the, the technical excellence is usually in the private sector and, and it's a little bit more efficient to, to to uh, sustain that. So. Uh, Mr. Ingram? Yeah, I would just say that, that you answered the question yourself when you said both at the end. An AID needs a larger number of better trained and skilled staff who have the technical capacity and experience to design programs, 
to manage and oversee programs that are carried out in the field by nonprofit and for-profit organizations that have more detailed, specific expertise. But they also, you need to understand that that expertise by AID staffers, they spend a lot of time engaging with their counterparts in developing countries, in ministries, and in other institutions. And that is part of the development process. And that AID staff needs to be sufficiently knowledgeable that they can transfer information to those senior officials that they're dealing with. So they play both design the projects and oversee them, but also providing advice. Mr. Cundin. Sir, I, <clears throat> thank you for asking that question. This is what I've spent a good bit of my time wrestling with the last seven years. Uh, my view is that clearly there's got to be some balance between uh, making use of the enormous capacity in the American private sector, universities, private businesses, and so forth. And on the other hand, we need enough people internally, as Dr. Melito is saying, to oversee this. Because if you don't know what you're talking about, then the private sector is going to snooker you sometimes. And so I think the, the pendulum has swung a bit too far on the side of not having enough oversight within the government. And that's why Dr. Merlito is talking about these pathetically small numbers, four versus nine. I mean, come on, we've got to get serious about this. We're managing billions of dollars of the taxpayers' money. Uh, uh, we hire, we, we have a locust plague reliably every 17 years in Africa. We do not need to have world-class entomologists on staff waiting for 17 years. We need, when we need them, we should hire them from the private sector. But certainly we need people on staff who, who can oversee the technical specialists that we hire. And right now the pendulum has swung way too far. We don't have enough bodies to oversee the taxpayers' dollars. Thank you. I yield back both my time and the gavel. The ranking member and I were just discussing <clears throat> how best to manage, because it's management, I think, that is really important. And um, I really feel that the nonprofits, the people on the ground that have been there in the villages and so on, let's take Africa, for instance, uh, can relate better to the circumstances, but in some Places they might be too young, and some places they might be too irrelevant. Uh, I do know that uh, in more traditional societies, you really have to go to the chief. Uh, at my station was the Nan Marquis, someone who could really interpret. Can I hear some comment about that? I don't think one pattern fits the global environment if we're going to restructure. I think we have to go region by region. I'd like to get some response from any of you that'd like to speak to that. How do we manage these programs? How do we supervise them and who should? I, I would offer that, that there are, uh, first, there, there are so many different approaches among the NGOs uh, that to their intervention and how they relate to the, the, villager, the villages and what have you. For, there are some that, that have uh, numerous expats, for example, operating from the country level down, and they may have a presence in the village, and others where they don't. They have purely uh, local nationals managing the country office, and they just have qu headquarters staffing them. Uh, I, I think everybody who works in, in, who's worked in development and, and been out to those villages uh, realizes, we hope, and, and appreciates that one of the skills that you have to bring is the ability to relate effectively with uh, the villagers and the beneficiaries. So um, every organization that, that is engaged in these sort of activities is, is operating a little bit differently or structured a little bit differently, uh, but I hope that they would have that standard of, of effective engagement with the, the beneficiaries. I, I, I'm, if there's exceptions to that, I don't have an explanation. So. Dr. Melito. The, the model that AID uses is a hybrid model of using number of individuals hired in the countries that are providing the services as well as a cadre of, of international or American-led staff. 
and, it, and, and it works very well in certain cases. In some instances, it doesn't work well at all. It, it, part of my other work is looking at food assistance. And uh, we were struck uh, when we visited Zambia a couple of years ago that the projects that we were visiting, there had been no American AID official had visited there in, in several years. And it turns out that there had only been nine monitors for food assistance for a $2 billion budget worldwide. So it, 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 we, there were concerns with timeliness. We had also shown in cases where food had not uh, basically had rotted. And so there, was, there were definitely concerns we were raising. And part of what we were finding was part of it was there was not a good information flow from the field back to headquarters on how to address these things. So there needs to be a right balance between, um, I think, permanent staff who can monitor as well as uh, uh, people hired in the field who actually have good working knowledge. Ms. Jinkman. Yeah. If you, um, there's a little section of my statement where I talk about the importance of analysis. Um, and it's not just having different operating uh, mechanisms by region, it's by whether or not you're working at the community level or the national level. It depends on whether or not you're in a middle income country or you're in Sudan or Somalia. And so what you have to do is before you get involved in an activity, you've got to be get very careful in analyzing the dynamics in that community, in that country, in that situation, and then bring in your intervention, gear your interventions according to is the decision maker the chief? Is the decision maker uh, the church in that entity? Uh, do you need to bring community organizers in there just to bring the community together to begin with to see what their, their interests are? So you've got to have multiple mechanisms, but it starts with good analysis. I'm going to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Bilbrey. Yeah, to follow up on this, Mr. Ingram, a good example is we send somebody in and um, NGO feels, okay, we're in Afghanistan, so we'll go into Kabul and hire somebody to be our liaison. You send somebody from, from Kabul into Kandahar and to talk to a Pashtun um, and not go to the chief. The chief now sees that the agent that we're using is a competitor to his, his authority and creates a whole new you know, dynamic that creates a lot of problems. And we've seen this happen again and again is that we take our first world mentality and try to apply it there. You know, I was just telling the chair, uh, chairwoman, one of the first things you do in a Polynesian or Micronesian island is go and meet with the, the chief of the island so you get permission. And even when you go to places like the San Blas Islands in Panama, you always go to the elder. We bypass that to a large degree because we've gone to Kandahar and think that, you know, an Afghani is an Afghani is an Afghani. Um, how do we avoid this in the future? And have you, you know, and, and I'm open to comments on that. If you think that this is a, a, a wrong observation, I would, I would uh, encourage you to, you know, uh, state it. Well, I would say that in my statement, I emphasize the need to improve the technical capacity of USAID. Um, I also should have said we need to in, improve the cultural knowledge and the, in, in the regional knowledge of the staff and the language capability. And I think a uh, mistake we have made both when we went into Iraq and when we went into Afghanistan is we didn't listen to some of our old hands who had been around those parts of the world for 20 and 30 years and really knew the culture and knew the political dynamics. And we spent, need to spend more resources and more time planning on some of that cultural and political analysis. Mr. Walsh, how much of this could have been, though, the State Department and the military's concept in Afghanistan of wanting to reinforce the authority of the central government because there had been such a lack of central authority in Afghanistan? How much of this could have been a direct conscious effort at strengthening the new government rather than trying to work with the traditional structure? I, I simply don't know that, uh, the circumstances, but I would offer that that most of the people who work with these NGOs are country directors that have been there in programs oftentimes, you know, 5, 10, 15 years. So uh, I have no explanation as to why there is a disconnect, a cultural disconnect, but more often than not, the NGOs have been there before AID showed up and, and before there was an intervention, and they, they should have some cultural sophistication, but there's no guarantees on that. But I, I don't know to what extent that the politics of that was dri driven the, the, the 
Mr. Bill, Mr. Bill Bray, I would argue, I mean, with, to defend my aid colleagues a little bit, I, I think they, they fully well understand that an Afghan is not an Afghan is not an Afghan. The, the, the problem, in my view, respectfully, has been one of resources. It, there, 20 years ago, if aid sent somebody up country in Laos, they spoke Lao. They probably had been trained in all the kinds of things you are correctly pointing out in terms of cultural awareness and, and anthropological mapping and all that. The reality is, as the number, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, aid was sent into a lot more countries in Central Asia. We went into more countries, as Dr. Melito pointed out, handed more dollars to program in more program areas, environment and so forth, while the whole time the staff was shrinking by 80 percent. And with all due respect, I, the, the kind of assignments we made is we had a warm body, we sent them to Anbar province or Ghazni or so, and, and we didn't have the time to give them the language training. So to me, the question you're raising, it's a very profound question, is directly related to the resourcing issue. USAID needs more staff because then they'll have time to do the language training and the cultural training, the cultural awareness training, because you're pointing out a critical point, but you give them 1,100 officers around 85 countries, and, and uh, you know what the demand right now is we need more people in the PRTs in Afghanistan. We need more aid officers to advise our military officers. Well, do I have time to send them to Pashtun training? Of course not. Or, I mean, not me anymore, but the guys who are there now. But anyway, th th that would, I see this as directly related to the resources, sir. Mr. Holtz, you have additional questions? And then Mr. Connolly. Mr. Holtz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about um, the problem of coherence uh, and vision. Um, throughout the testimony of, of the panel, um, it is clear to me, at any rate, that not only do we need a coherent national security strategy, but one in which development assistance um, and our smart power is integrated as an essential part of an overall national security strategy. Within the realm of our assistance, and aid, it strikes me that we need to establish priorities and come up with a vision, a coordinating vision that will guide our efforts. One of the things that uh, I note is the spread of our development efforts across the governmental agencies. 53% uh, USAID and the rest spread through multiple agencies. So somebody in a foreign country who wants to deal with a development issue uh, may go to uh, the Agriculture Department for one thing, may go to the Department of Energy for another, may come to USAID people for another. How do we get a handle on this in the intervening time, starting now, between where we are and ultimately where we want to get to with a rewrite of the bill and all that? What do we do now um, in order to get a handle on this and start coordinating our development efforts amongst all these government, governmental agencies, or is that an impossible idea? Uh, Mr. Kunder, do you want to start? Uh, sir, it's a very critical question, um, and I would point out that the answer to it lies in part in what Mr. Ingram said, is that U.S. foreign policy and U.S. foreign aid are coordinated partially in Washington, and they are coordinated partially at our embassies around the world. So you have to address it, I would argue, at both ends. Uh, I have argued, uh, and I touched on this in my statement, that we need to create a new set of coordination mechanisms. That's why I mentioned I didn't think the genie could be put back in the bottle. You can't tell the energy department in our globalized world, you have nothing to do with the international arena. You have to stay here. Of course they're going to be involved. EPA is going to be involved. CDC is going to be involved. So my view is that you would create, under the aid administrator, a new uh, administration uh, development coordination council, where each of the assistant secretaries from the relevant domestic departments would attend. There would be some shared information we'd establish across the country, across the government, strategic goals. Then at the country level, you would have, again, under the aid, aid mission director in that country, you would write a country strategic plan. What are the United States of America's development objectives in this country? Is it family planning? Is it education? Is it health care? Then all of the government agencies 
present in that country would be working together towards that set of goals. So my view is that both in Washington and the field, you, we need to create, and I would say this should be put into the uh, rewrite of the Foreign Assistance Act, is some new set of coordination mechanisms that simply don't exist now. We, when, when, this, when the Foreign Assistance Act was written, we didn't have this kind of globalization of the domestic departments. And so we didn't, we didn't perceive the need for these kinds of mechanisms. Today, we desperately need such new coordination mechanisms. Any other thoughts from the panel? Mr. Ingram? Yeah, let me just um, use your question to make a point, because uh, Jim answered your question nicely. And that is, and I think you recognize it in the way you posed the question, is coordination is an important, useful, second best solution. And you, you first consolidate as much as you can so that like programs are brought together under common management. And then you don't have the coherence problem. And those programs that aren't core to USAID or the development function, um, or you decide should remain independent, they get coordinated. But if you consolidate as much as possible that makes rational sense, then you have less of a coordination problem. It, taking off from what you've said, it, uh, is there an adequate do we know adequately what all the programs are? I mean, is there a central repository of this knowledge that says, here are all the programs that need to be either coordinated or managed and consolidated and or coordinated? Do we know what all the programs are, Mr. Melito? I, oh, I'm sorry. I would suggest that we do not know. I would say, though, uh, we have an ongoing study on U.S. efforts to fight global hunger. And we've thus far identified 10 different U.S. agencies which have that as one of their missions. It's, we have a lot of work ahead to see exactly how they overlap, how they differ, how they coordinate. But it's, uh, that was a surprising number for us, that there are 10 agencies. So it strikes me that the, the first question is, let's get a handle in terms of, let's just get a handle on what all the programs are and which agencies are doing what. That seems to be job number one. My question about a coordinating council uh, is that in order first to deal with the consolidation issue, um, I'm not sure that a coordinating council is the body that could deal with the consolidation issue. So it strikes me that there needs to be some responsibility, perhaps yeah, and, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, maybe in the State Department, maybe somewhere else, but some responsibility at a top level to order the review and consolidation uh, of various programs across agencies and then deal with the coordination as the second step. Am, am, I, am I on track with that? And I would say that you've got to raise it to the highest levels of government. That mandate has to come from the Congress and the President. Okay. Thanks. I yield back. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, well, uh, and if I could add my two cents, I, I, yeah. I think we need to be loud and clear that the lead development agency of the United States government is AID. It's not the EPA. It's not CDC. It's not the Department of Labor, though they may all have pieces of it. Um, the lead agency has to be AID or its successor. But otherwise, we're floundering around and we, and we lack the coherence my colleague Mr. Hose just referred to. Um, I, I want to go back to uh, 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 mission for a minute. Uh, I know Mr. Ingram and his colleagues are involved in a, trying to rewrite the Foreign Assistance Act to make it more coherent. And I was intrigued, Mr. Kunder, with your suggestion that maybe what we need to do is uh, focus on, uh, on a task. Let's end malaria. Let's end literacy. Uh, let's uh, let's end illiteracy, uh, uh, and and that has a certain attraction to it. But let me ask this: I, I, certainly, Congress is as guilty as anybody over the since the forming of foreign assistance, uh, as we know it, uh, in encrusting the Foreign Assistance Act with multiple purposes. Uh, biodiversity. I can remember I was part of that one myself, uh, and. Uh, all of them noble causes, and uh, I don't know how you resist that, but uh, does it make sense to 
have a, a more streamlined agency that is focused on a handful of things and only those things, or do we need to preserve the flexibility to understand that in the real world, AID and or its successor agency is going to serve a multiplicity of purposes? Sir, I, I've suggested that if we were a business, we would have gone out of business a long time ago because we tried to stay in every business sector known to mankind. Um, 50 or 60 different kinds of programs around the world, literally mountain gorilla habitat. Uh, and uh, you can't do that. So I think my, my view is, but you have, to, you have to operate in the real world, as you, as you correctly point out. My view is that, that, that such a strategy would have to have three elements. First, you would have to define some of the broad strategic objectives, like the Millennium Development Goals, like ending illiteracy, some very broad strategic objectives. Second, you would have to supplement that with some sort of uh, opportunities fund, because things are going to pop up that nobody can foresee and there are going to be political pressures to contribute to some multilateral effort to take on a new disease. So, so you can't hamstring the whole problem. So you need some sort of supplementary opportunities fund. And third, you need to refresh the system every couple of years. I've testified that the on these uh, that if uh, that I would respectfully recommend that if the Congress is going to rewrite the Foreign Assistance Act, they build into it something like the Department of Defense's quadrennial de defense review because you can't say now and forever the answer is illiteracy or now and forever the answer is malaria. But what the Defense Department does is, is, is manage an interagency uh, quadrennial review of what are the current strategic threats and then we reorient our defense programs to those strategic threats. But at least we achieve a consensus every four years and I think such a flexible model might be applicable to the foreign uh, aid arena as well. Yeah. Uh, Representative Connolly, as you pointed out, I think the Congress is part of the problem. Um, and I don't know how to get around that part of the problem because most of those congressional interests in specific atoms, as you say, are quite legitimate and important. You also have a problem on the ground in that every country has different interests. But what does come to the fore for me is when you look at the history of foreign assistance, and you look at where the successes are. The successes are where the U.S. AID, where the U.S. government, where the international community has tackled a particular problem for 10 years. The Green Revolution, oral rehydration, polio. Um, and it's important, and, and, and that leads you to the direction of let's choose a few priorities and focus our resources on those. But development is much more complicated and much more complex than tackling a few clear problems. And I guess if I had my druthers, I would like to see a foreign assistance program that tackles five global problems and 70 or 80 percent of our assistance is devoted to tackling those in public-private partnerships for 10 years. And then the other 30 percent, whatever percent you choose, goes to deal with a lot of these other more complicated human aspects of development. Two, two points about that. The, way, the problem is, with the best of intentions, the way bureaucracies work. If you don't write it into the law, we don't do it. And so you lose, because we, we generally don't act flexibly. Uh, and so, you know, if you, if you list these are the ten things we're going to do, by God, if an eleventh comes up that isn't one of the ten, we're not going to do it, even if we should be. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's, you know, potentially a problem with that approach, but it may be worth it. Let me, let me ask can I, can a final question. respond to that? Certainly. Um, as you, as you note, will note, the Foreign Assistance Act is 700 pages. Um, and I would suggest to you that most of what's in the Foreign Assistance Act is not followed by the bureaucracy. Well, in fact, it is so complicated and so complex that bureauc people in the bureaucracy several, seldom pick it up. And when you come to rewriting the Foreign Assistance Act, keep it short and sweet and put in there what you really care about and what you really care about keeping, holding, making the bureaucracy accountable. Yes, uh, although I would, I know you know this, having helped write the foreign aid bill, 
The problem with foreign aid is it's an orphan up here. And so one of the reasons it's so barnacle encrusted is because you're trying to pull together a coalition of support. And if, you know, biodiversity is important to this member of Congress, we'll put it in if we can get his or her vote. Um, final point, uh, question, Madam Chairman, uh, if I may. Uh, you talked about trying to, you, you, you characterize AID as a risk averse culture. Uh, and George, I heard, Mr. Ingram, I heard you talk about the need to, for Congress to show some flexibility in, a, in actually encouraging risk. And I think there are a lot of reasons perhaps why we've evolved into a risk averse culture. But let me ask you, you part of the problem. Uh, my own experience uh, when I did this, uh, I, I wrote the foreign assistance bill on the other side of the aisle, uh, of the House, uh, often would get audit reports from GAO or from the IG that were very thoughtful and really helped illuminate problems. But sometimes we got some that frankly took no cognizance of how difficult this work is. No cognizance of the fact that you're in a work environment that may be engaged in a civil war or huge natural disasters or just adverse conditions that boggle the mind and they're doing the best they can. And the fact they didn't produce eight widgets, they only produced seven, is not quite the ding you might think it is. Training auditors and IGs to actually understand this working environment, I think is a challenge. And I just wonder if you'd comment on it. GAO places balance and fairness at a, at a, at a, as a very high priority of ours. And I, I stress with my staff, you know, we, visit, we go in country, and part of why you go in country is not just to, to see what's going on, but actually to really appreciate more how difficult this is. And I think we do a very good job of that. Um, part of also what we're, we're trying to do, though, is to maximize the effectiveness of these programs, help maximize it, and also get the most for the taxpayers' money. It's a very difficult balance that we're trying to achieve. Um, I think, though, we have a very f uh, productive and very positive uh, working relationship with AID. Could I, say, say, could I say something very briefly, sir? I, I agree with George, though, that the message does have to come from the Congress. I have no problem with the work that GAO does, never did. But, but the message, what, what, if you're an aid officer and you're sent off to Afghanistan, what you're hearing, you're, you're seeing what's going on. First of all, the, the size of our own in, internal inspector general staff has increased every year. Then, on top of that, the Congress has created both a Special Inspector General for Iraq, now a Special F F Inspector General for Afghanistan. You're just being told by the Congress. Our people are highly intelligent. You're being told, be cautious. Uh, I mean, and, and there's nothing wrong with being cautious. And, and if I would say, I want to say something, because I, I really believe this deeply, that considering the environments aid officers work in, I know there are occasional scandals because I dealt with every one of them in the last seven years. But by and large, we are giving the taxpayer a level of oversight in, in these kind of difficult environments that is comparable to what we're getting in the city of Alexandria, where somebody just told $170,000 from the parking meters. I mean, you can't catch everything. But, but the, uh, the, the problem is the message is clearly one of don't take any chances. And you can't succeed in Afghanistan without taking some chances. It appears uh, 